is in memory of Dr. Charles Harold Feldman, dedicated by the Agus family and Feldman family, Yitzhak Tzvi ben Yaakov Lea, who passed away on the second night of Hanukkah. He was a distinguished physician and a community leader, and he greeted everyone he met with a twinkle in his eye, and he was very devoted to his family and to Torah learning, and the family is comforted to know that the learning will be in his memory. I can personally say that I I met Dr. Feldman and um, and I'm very fond of the Agus and Feldman families. So um, may his neshama have an aliyah and may his memory be for a blessing. Um, okay, we are going to shift now to the learning. Um, I, I actually caught a little bit. Uh, I was listening, partially listening to Yael uh, Shior pieces of it as, as I was putting the finishing touches on my on my slideshow. Um, and uh, you have access hopefully to the source sheet through uh, the Matan link, but also I am going to be sharing the sources on the slideshow in front of you. Uh, so don't worry, you'll see everything uh, coming up on the screen. Uh, it's so nice to see many of you with your cameras on. Anyone who would like to keep your camera on, I always encourage. And, um, and thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, okay, so today I heard a little bit in the last year that we were, you were learning about um, the Hashmonaim and Sefer HaMakabim and some of the descriptions and historical descriptions of the, of, of the Hanukkah holiday. We are, going to, we are going to talk about that today as well uh, in a slightly different, in a very different context. We are taking things to Tkufat HaTalmud, the Talmudic period, and after. There's an interesting issue in telling the history of this holiday in that we do have some books, some historical books which mention it. Of course, the book of books of Maccabees. We're going to see there's also a book called from the second temple period called Megillat Ta'anit. But the, the uh, Chag HaChanukah, the holiday of Chanukah is also retold in the Talmud a couple of hundred years afterwards. And what's really interesting is to look at what the focus is there. Um, this class is part of a greater context of what we're studying together this year. I know I have my regulars here. I see some of them. Um, we are learning about tefillah in general. And so what I've done is I've, I've really organized this class on Chanukah to fit in with our course on tefillah. And so I'd like to look at what is the meaning behind Hanukkah? What are we celebrating on Hanukkah? And how, um, how does this fit in with our tefillot? And of course, one of the things that we emphasize on Hanukkah is the miracle, the ness of the shemen, the miracle of the oil. And so um, one of the things that we're going to see is that there's a very interesting philosophical conversation which emerges amongst the halachic, halachic authorities, the, the rabbis throughout history, as to how do we view miracles? Um, can we pray for a miracle? Some of you may have a similar experience to me, which is that even in the most mundane things, like if you find a parking lot, <laughs> <laughs> um, especially on Friday, Arab Shabbat, if you find a parking space, you say, oh, what a miracle, it's a miracle. <laughs> and so, yes, it's wonderful to see miracles in such small things, but we also know that we, miracles play a very important part of our theology and our ideology. Uh, for instance, when we talk about the miracles of Egypt, Yitziat Mitraim, the, the, we, we say Kiddush every Friday night and we acknowledge the miracle of the Exodus from Egypt. Um, when we have the seder on Pesach, we are acknowledging the miracles that God did for us. And these are miracles which were really supernatural, such as the splitting of the sea, very supernatural miracle. Um, how does that compare to the Hanukkah miracle? This is one of the themes we're going to explore today. And what kind of miracles are we actually allowed to ask for? I mean, anyone can ask for anything. What do the rabbis recommend? We, what sort of miracles we talk about and ask for and pray for in our lives today? So I'm going to just um, uh, share my screen with you. Okay. Okay, just a moment, and we will begin. Okay. Should have had it on the first slide. Okay, so um, 
We're going to look in particular at the tefillah, which we say on Hanukkah, called Al Hanisim. Of course, we also could talk about Hallel, but I actually spoke about that last year at Matan's Yomi Yun Hanukkah, so we'll be talking about that later in our course. Um, but for now, I, I'm going to focus on Al Hanisim, and uh, we're going to look at the actual text of it and talk about where we say it in just a moment. Um, anyone who uh, who has a particular, as we mentioned, Egypt, I'll just to play a second for you from this song. There can be miracles when you believe. Though hope is frail, it's hard to kill. Who knows what miracles you can achieve? Okay. So, of course, the, the idea behind the miracle of, um, of, uh, of Pesach uh. is that we, in, in, in the story of Yetziat Mitraim of the Exodus, there, there was the potential for miracles, and there was incredible miracles, and in the biblical world, that was completely within the realm of possible. But we live in a post-biblical world, and in fact, Hanukkah is the first, really, the only post-biblical holiday sanctioned by the rabbis of the Talmud. And so we have to see how we bridge these themes and how it fits in with, um, with the different aspects of Jewish holidays. So let's begin with some sources. Sorry. Okay, um, we're going to look at how the story of Hanukkah is portrayed in the Talmud, okay? The, the Talmud does not spend a lot of time talking about Hanukkah, but it says as follows, that Hanukkah is discussed in the Talmud in Masachet Shabbat. Why is it discussed in Masachet Shabbat? Because in Masachet Shabbat, we're talking about candlelighting on Shabbat. And so the natural thematic association for the Talmudic rabbis was to talk about candlelighting on Hanukkah as well, which gets us into a conversation about the purpose of Hanukkah and why we have Hanukkah. And so the Gemara asks famously, um, in Masachet Shabbat, my Hanukkah, what is Hanukkah? Why, and now we're going to just try and stick with the Hebrew, with the Aramaic here, the original, um, what is Hanukkah? Now, um, we see here that it says, Titanu Rabbanan, the rabbis learned in Abraita, and in fact, you'll notice in the English it says this is actually the source of this Abraita is from Megillah Tani, the Second Temple work, which we can't don't have time to talk about today. The Cafe de Kislev Yomi de Hanukkah Tmanaya. On the twenty fifth of Kislev, we celebrate eight days of Hanukkah. Um, uh, and what are, what are we allowed to do? What are we not allowed to? We're not allowed to eulogize on them. Um, and we can't fast on them. Okay, Megillah Ta'anit is the, the scroll of fast days. And so this is days that you're not allowed to fast on. What happened on Hanukkah? What are we, what are we, what are we, what are we what's worth noting that we're doing this? Why can't we eulogize or why can't we fast? There was something to celebrate. When the Greeks came into the sanctuary, they, um, they defiled all the oils that were in the sanctuary. So when the Hashmonaim um, were victorious over the Greeks, uh, they came into the temple, into the sanctuary, and they couldn't find any oil that was um, permissible to use other than one pach shemen, one flask, and um, and it, it had the uh, seal of the high priest. It was still considered pure and usable. But it was only enough for one, one night, one day. So just for a moment, if anyone wants to um, speak up for really just a quick answer, what is being emphasized here in the Talmud? Is it the, we, what, what, what are we celebrating on Hanukkah? What is mentioned here? You can, uh, what is, we got the discovery of the oil. Okay, very good. Who said that? I see, okay. So, um, so, so yes. I did. 
Exactly. Uh, I don't have a name here. So we see that what's being emphasized here is the discovery of the oil, okay? And in fact, there's quite an emphasis on that. Thank you for pointing that out. But we do have mention, we have mention of um, when the Hasmoneans um, uh, were victorious over the Greeks, but it's almost like it's telling us this by the by. You need to know that we won so that we could have access to the oil and to the sanctuary, but it wasn't the ikar, it wasn't the main victory, the main thing we're celebrating. The main thing we're celebrating is the lights that the oil, there was a miracle with this oil and the oil lasted. Um, very good, but both are mentioned, but there is this element of downplaying. And we have to try and understand why uh, why that's downplayed. I believe that in the last year you heard more about the emphasis on the victorious, um, uh, the victory of the wars, of the battles. And so why are the rabbis downplaying that? What I find interesting is that we are very happy to, whoops, I don't want the LED. Yeah, I can hear. Oh, sorry. Okay, I thought you were speaking to us, okay. We'd love to hear you later. So, um, so now, now I'd like to share with you for a moment. Um, that is the Talmud explaining why we have Hanukkah. Now we're going to look at one of the things we say on Hanukkah is this tefillah, this bracha, this tefillah of Al Hanisim um, for the miracles, on the miracles, and um, and we say this twice. We say this on two holidays, on Hanukkah and on Purim. Um, and so, what I'd like to what I'd like to ask you is, let's hear, let's listen. What's being emphasized here? Um, so we say as follows. We thank you, Hashem, for the miracles of the redemption, the mighty deeds, the deliverances, the wonders, the consolations, and for the wars that you performed for our fathers in those days at this season. And then it goes on. And what is it emphasizing? In the days of Matisyao, the son of Yochanan, the high priest, the Hashmonaim and his son, the Hasmonean and his sons, when the evil Greek kingdom rose up against your people to make them forget your Torah and to turn them away from the statutes of your will. Okay, what did Hashem do? Um, you and your abundant mercy, God, stood by them in their time of distress. You defended their cause. You judged their grievances. You avenged them. You delivered the mighty into the hands of the weak, many into the hands of the few, defiled the people into the defiled people into the hands of the undefiled, the wicked into the hands of the righteous, the sinners into the hands of the students of Torah. Okay, so and um, through this, what's happening? Um, through this, there was a kiddush Hashem. There was a there was a glorifying of Hashem's name and a great salvation. And then your children, your sons came to your home, your house, your temple, and cleaned it up, and lit these candles in the chater, in the outer courtyard, and they dedicated and set for history that each year it should be like this to commemorate this this liberation of the temple and the re-sanctification of the temple. Hanukkah, of course, means um, the uh, initiation, the sanctifying. Hanukkah tabayit, we say, when we dedicate, dedicate a home, dedicate, they have rededicated the temple. Lehodot um, lahalel l'shimcha hagadol, to praise Hashem and Hashem's great name. Um, and so we see that what's being emphasized here is we have a different voice. We have a different um, portrayal here than in the Talmud. If in the Talmud the emphasis was on the lighting of the can, on the lighting of the Hanukkah, of the of the pach, the miracle of the flask of oil, and we just mentioned the Hashmonaim for a second because that's how we got in there. Here the emphasis is different. Here the emphasis is very clear. We are we are acknowledging and celebrating the military victory, the military aspect of this holiday. Listen to the words. Um, um, 
גיבורים ביד חלשים, במסעת גיבורים ביד חלשים ורבים ביד מעטים you have Hashem. There was something miraculous about this. We were few, the odds were against us, and yet we overcame. As I'm saying this, um, I'm sure some of you in your head are making the association of today, our world today in Israel. We certainly have felt through the wars, especially at the time of the establishment of state, and especially the Yom Kippur War, there was an element in the Six Day War, there was an element of the miraculous, of we, maybe we, on, on the, if the, the, the statistics, the evidence would be against us, and yet somehow we overcame. So here too, the, there's, there's an actual war going on, we did our share, but Hashem brought us to the finish line, helped us achieve the miraculous victory. Um, but here we see the military side is also, um, is also emphasized, which is interesting that we're finding these different voices. There have been different theories among academics about why it is that the Talmud downplays um, the military side of the Hanukkah story and the military victory. One possible um, likely solution is that once the Hashmonaim took over in the temple, the priests, the Kohanim, in future generations over the years started to become corrupt and started to become Hellenized and, um, and, and very much um, proponents of Greek culture. And so that was really steering away from the rabbis and that was disapproved of from rabbis. So for the rabbis, they're very happy that the Hashmonaim were able to bring back the, the temple and rededicate the sanctuary, but the way that the family line um, went on and the way they practiced going forward was disapproved of. And so, and so the rabbis had some discomfort with celebrating the Maccabim and the Hashmonaim because of what happened later. And remember, they're looking back in hindsight a couple of hundred years later, which is an important point. Okay, so now what does this have to do with our topic? <laughs> Can we pray for a miracle? Um, now, so far in what we've seen, we haven't seen in al Hanisim that it said um, anything about us praying for a miracle. And yet we need to see, this is a very pivotal text for our Shir, a very significant text. Let's see what happens when we get to the world of the codification of Halakha. We're jumping ahead many, many years to the Shulchan Aruch, okay? Um, the Talmud is the great... Um, um, legal text from which all halacha is drawn, and yet later on we have the the um, the legal authorities continue to codify um, law, and so the Shulchan Aruch is one of the major major um, codifications, and we see that the Shulchan Aruch says as follows, um, starting here: Kol Shmonat Yemei Chanukah. Omer al Hanisim. Now here the Shulchan Aruch is telling us in the laws of tefillah and prayer, when do we say this prayer al Hanisim? Um, it says that we say it, I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar, we say this during benching, during the, the, um, the prayer after eating. During the section of blessing of the land, and we also say it in tefillah. Where do we say it in tefillah? In Shmonasre, there's a section where we say al Hanisim. So far, so good, nothing new, nothing um, so related to whether or not we can pray for a miracle. Now we have the comment of the Ramah, Rav Moshe Iselis, the Ashkenazic um, authority who writes glosses on the Shulchan Aruch, Rabbi Yosef Karo. So the Ramah says as follows, here. Yes, Omrim, kshashachach al hanisim, bebrikat amazon, kshemegia laharachaman yoma. Okay, so what is he saying here? Let's say it happens sometimes, right? When you're on Shabbat and you're saying Berkat Amazon, you forget the section you're supposed to say for Shabbat. Okay, what happens on Hanukkah if you forget, you're still in the middle of benching and you forget to say Al Hanisim in its proper place. So the Ramah says, you can go back and say something short in its place during the during when we get to the sections of the Harachamans. You can say, Harachaman yase lanu nisim veniflaot. The Ramah throws in this very interesting comment, which seems uh, it's actually slightly different from our Al Hanisim, and says, actually, you can say, um, Hashem should, should do for the merciful one, should make miracles for us, just like you made for our forefathers in those days, in the days of Matityahu. It's interesting to note that it's a different version, but it also, what really highlights here is 
that it's suddenly saying we can pray for Hashem to make miracles for us, just as Hashem made miracles at other times throughout Jewish history, which is a fascinating point. And this point we're going to see awakens debate and, um, and discomfort among some of the commentaries on this Ramah. We're going to get back to that in a few minutes. Um, now I'd like to zoom out a little. And before we get back to this Ramah and explore how we solve this question of can we actually ask for a miracle, let's go back again to the Talmud and see what the Talmud says in general about um, what is the sort of Talmudic worldview of miracles. Now, the fun thing about learning Talmud is that you can pretty much find different voices on everything. And so you can find voices that will, you know, that will often, often you can find both perspectives, right? That you can pray, that you should pray for a miracle, that you shouldn't pray for a miracle. But we need to see what, um, what the sources say about praying for miracles. So let's have a look. First, we're going to look at the Mishnah in Brachot, in chapter nine of Brachot, where it talks about um, where it talks about what you do when you go to a place where a miracle has, done, has been done. So it says as follows. If you um, stumble upon a place where a miracle has been done for Israel. So for instance, if you happen to go on a teal to Yamsuf, <laughs> where there was the splitting of the sea. Omer baruch shasa nisim lavotenu b'makom hazeh. You should say this, this bracha, uh, blessed is Hashem who did a miracle for Am Yisrael in this place. Um, okay, that's what I want to see from there. So we see that certainly there is um, a belief in miracles. We know that there's obviously modern philosophers and, and philosophers his, historically have argued that perhaps miracles are not to be believed and we shouldn't believe anything that we don't have direct evidence of. Um, and yet here we know that part of Jewish um, faith is to believe in the miracles that we were told in the Torah. And so, and so this Mishnah is saying, this is an acknowledgement of that, that, you, that there were great miracles, supernatural miracles in the Torah and we have to acknowledge them and that's part of our belief. Um, now the question is, okay, can you pray for a miracle? The Mishnah goes on a few sentences later and says, So in the context of miracles, the Mishnah says, someone who cries over the past, meaning wants to try and not just cries over the past, but wants to change the past, okay, prays to change the past, that is a vain prayer. That is a prayer that is in vain. It's useless. It's not going to change anything. This is a very um, interesting um, piece. It says, if a man's wife was pregnant and he says, may it be his will, that may be God's will, that my wife bear a male child. Right? Why is that a vain prayer? Okay, because the woman is already pregnant. So, you know, yes, you can kind of say, you know, I hope it's this, I hope it's that, but to pray to Hashem that it is of a particular sex, boy or girl, um, would be, it's, it's a useless prayer. It's a vain prayer. It's already been determined, the sex of the child. Um, okay, similarly, if he is coming home from a journey and he hears a cry of distress in the town and says, May it be his will that this is not those of my house. This is also a vain prayer. So these are two very concrete examples of, um, um, you know, you can pray, may please God, may whoever's crying out, especially if it's my family, be okay. But to say, may, it, to try and erase history, to pray to erase history, or to change something that's already been determined is considered a prayer in vain. Now I take us back, for those of you who study with me regularly, we just recently learned about kavana, intention in tefillah. And this is part of this package of, it's important to uh, take tefillah seriously, to not do it um, from a place of frivolity, um, to do it from a little bit more of a place of, of seriousness and intention. And so we see that this is a similar idea. We shouldn't mock prayer and use it when it's not going to be, when it's clearly not going to be effective. Um, so that is the introduction in Mishnah Brachot to this. Um, the Talmud on this 
Mishnah, which talks about changing the sex of a fetus, which is already determined, um, actually raises a, an example in the Torah of where this actually was, was, was um, we can prove otherwise. And this is in the context of a very important Talmudic principle, which is important for us, in mas kirin ma'aset nisim. Okay, so let's see what this means. So the, the Talmud goes on and explains that further elucidates the Mishnah. So if his wife was pregnant and says, may it be God's will that my wife have a male child, um, that's a vain prayer, meaning it's already been determined whether it's male or female. So the Gemara questions this and says, is that really true? This prayer is really ineffective? We have a case to disprove this. Meiti Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yosef responds, a couple of weeks ago in Parshat HaShavua, we read the story of, of Yaakov and Leah having children. And after Leah has a number of boys, while her sister Rachel has not yet had children, it says that after she has a number of boys, she had a girl. And of course, in this week's past, this past week's Parsha, we hear about the unfortunate incident that happens to this young woman. But for our purposes, we hear ve'achar. Why does it say ve'achar? And after she bore a daughter. What? There's no um, empty word in the Torah. There's no um, word which doesn't have a significant meaning. So what does it mean an after? Okay. My ve'achar. Amarav. La'achar shedana le'a din la'atzma. Le'a did... Um, um, pass judgment on herself. And of course, this Talmud is playing with the word Dean and Dana and Dina, okay? Her, she comes from the fact that Leah was selfless here and did a calculation and made a judgment on herself and said, Leah knew that Yaakov was gonna have 12 tribes come from him. She, she many. I've already had six of them. And the, and the, um, handmaidens have already had four. That does not leave many left for my sister. So what can we do? I'm pregnant now. I, I will feel terrible if I take a seventh. Hare asara, we greet 10. Okay, if she has, um, if, if this is a boy, then Rachel will only have the chance for one boy and she'll always have less sons than the maidservants, which is not enough of a status of kavod for her. So Leah managed to change the fetus within her, which was male, to female through her tefillah to Hashem. Even though we have this story, okay, which the Gemara then tries to go on and explain something was unique here. It was Leah. We're not a, none of us are are um, are one of the imahot, um, and so the Gemara um, says this is a unique case. In general, we still have to follow the Mishnah that we can't pray prayers which are in vain. And we have this principle, which the Gemara establishes, that one does not mention miraculous events, okay? Um, miraculous acts, okay? This is a principle of halacha. We don't, um, we don't try to overemphasize miracles, okay? We, we have the miracles that we have in the Torah and we are very thankful for them and they are an integral part of our faith and our belief, but we don't go around seeking miracles. We don't, um, we don't overuse miracles in Judaism. And so this is a very interesting, um, principle which has been established and probably has some basis in, probably has some um, uh, relationship to the world and what's going on um, as Christianity and Christian. Okay. Hello. Hi. 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 Hang on. We have to try and mute if you don't mind. Um, Okay, so, um, so, so, um, so we have here um, this principle of Inmas Kirin Masen Sim. We don't go around trying to promote miracles, um, overuse miracles, and this may have some relationship to the fact that, of course, as Christianity came on the scene, that became a defining element of Christianity. The idea of, you know, uh, the the tales in the New Testament. the tales in the New Testament of, of, um, of Jesus. This is of course not our religion, but to see that in some ways we, we, we 
we see that the overuse of miracles is not rooted in our faith. And so, um, and so there's a potential, it could be that there was some influence in that, but certainly already in the Talmud, we see the elements of this, that in Maskirin Masenisim, we don't go around assuming that if we're, a te, if we're, if we do mitzvot and we keep Torah, that God's going to make all these miracles for us. Okay, a little, um, a little uh, photographic moment. Um, we're going to see in a moment a Gemara, which talks about um, crossing a bridge. And it's interesting that in the Talmudic um, context, you can imagine that when they built bridges, the sort of built bridges, they didn't have the technology, they didn't have modern technology. And so crossing bridges were, was, um, was quite a scary thing. I'm gonna see in a moment that there's discussion about how much you can rely on a miracle when you cross a bridge amongst the Talmudic rabbis. This is, um, uh, I'm sure we're, we're all in the mood to travel uh, a little bit more than we're traveling these days. And so this is just very fond memories. I was in Panama with my family um, last year, seems like many years ago now. Um, and just when I read this Talmud, this image of these hanging bridges came to mind because it's really, it was really quite scary. We had to walk over seven of them and <laughs> <laughs> and so you see that this, you see what it must have felt like um, to have to cross a bridge, which you don't feel certain is safe um, without modern technology and all of the abilities we have today. So let's look at the Talmud. Um, this Talmudic story comes up, um, comes, comes up in Masachet Shabbat. And the discussion here is on a Mishnah which talks about women um, who, God forbid, died in childbirth. And one of the things that Gemara is discussing is um, the Gemara always tried to look for reasons and tried to understand why um, um, is it possible that during that time of childbirth, it's like uh, there was a sort there was a certain um, examination going on in terms of um, in terms of uh, women's accountability for their actions, and it was a it was a sort of theoretical conversation in the Talmud. Now we're going to see that the the Talmud now asks, well, what about men who are not having childbirth? How are they examined? So the Gemara says, the Gavri hechami badke. Okay, how are men examined for their actions? Um, Reish Lakish said, when they're crossing a bridge, I'm a Reish Lakish bisha asha orimal hagesher. So before we read the next. Um, sentence, I want to just um, insert here that sometimes in the Talmud, there is the reliance on the idea that Hashem will protect the tzadikim, the righteous, right? We certainly have this idea and we're going through it in the parshiot now. And we're going to get to that in Parshat HaShavua. And there's a pasuk, there's a verse in Tehillim that says, Shomer p'taim Hashem daloti beli Yoshua. Okay, so Hashem protects the simple or the righteous. I was brought low and he saved me. So sometimes this is used in the world of halacha, of Jewish law, to say, Shomer p'taim Hashem. Hashem protects the simple, those who keep mitzvot. Okay, so, so there's this idea that Hashem, we can rely. How, this brings up this question of how much should we be trying to save ourselves versus, um, versus how much do we just wait around and hope that that salvation will come? So the Talmud says as follows, for men, one of the ways we examine them, right, one of the times, and what it's really saying is what are the times where you start to feel, I'm scared, I'm in a place of um, trouble, perhaps Hashem is judging me, will I emerge safe and protected, okay? And this very much resonates with the, the stories we're reading about Yaakov now and his families in Parshat Shavua, as we'll see in a moment. So Reish Lakish says, when you're crossing a bridge, Gesher Vitulo, does that mean, um, uh, could it be that the Gemara is suggesting that, um, that it's only when he crosses a bridge? Um, no, it's actually Ke'en Gesher. Anytime you're on a place, which is a place where you start to feel nervous and scared to go there, a dangerous area, driving through dangerous neighborhoods, um, you may feel for a moment, okay, Hashem is going to, now is when Hashem is examining me and my actions and will I emerge safely from here, says the Talmud. So now we have a story about Rabbi Yanai. Rabbi Yanai, Badek Vavar. So Rabbi Yanai, when he would cross a bridge, um, would examine and then cross, okay? So he didn't just jump onto the bridge and run. He said, let me just make sure this bridge is stable. Rabbi Yanai Latame, he is, according to his reasoning, as we've seen that he says, Da'amar, 
A person should not stand in a place of danger and say, Hashem is going to make a miracle for me. Because maybe Hashem won't do a miracle for you. And if Hashem does do a miracle for him at that point, perhaps what will happen is it will be deducted from that person's merits. There is this concept in the Talmud that we all have this um, amount of merits in our favor, and that sometimes we perhaps use them up, okay? There's like a tab and we're using up the tab, kind of like at the Makolet in Israel where they where they uh, deduct your, they keep a tab for you. Um, so I'm a Rabbi Hanin. My Kra'a, how do we know that this is the case that we, we can sometimes lose some of our merit in, by Hashem protecting us? Because Yaakov, before he, in last week's Parsha, before he meets his brother Esav, is scared for his life. And it says, Katonti mikol hasidim mikol ha'amet. Yaakov says, I'm not worthy of all the mercies and of all the truth which Hashem has showed unto me, your servant. And what this means is that Hashem had been bestowing so much kindness on Yaakov that he was worried that his merits had been diminished. Um, and yet, um, and so, and so, and yet he is protected, okay? And so he's reassured that he has enough merits with Hashem to be protected. But what this is saying is, and of course, this relates to this question in life of um, how much should we put ourselves in a place of risk? Um, of course, we think about this in Israel as we have members of our family serving in the army. Of course, there's a certain amount we have to do um, to, to protect ourselves, to protect our country. But to go into a place unnecessarily of danger and say, Hashem will make a miracle for me, everything will be fine, is um, against the school of thought of Rabbi Yanai and this Talmud. Um, we don't rely on a miracle, okay? Um, uh, we are not so mesh, we are not reliant on a miracle here. Okay. Another Talmudic. Um, sugya section, which relates to this question of how much we need to do versus what Hashem will do for us, appears in back in Masachet Brachot. Um, in a moment, we're going to leave these Talmudic um, uh, uh, sections. I, the reason I'm bringing them is to show a little bit of the Talmudic worldview, and we're going to get back to our question of what can we actually pray for. So, so hang in for one, a few more moments. Um, in Masachet Brachot, it says. Here we're going to see a great and famous debate between two rabbis. And again, these, these debates have tremendous resonance for our world today. Um, and we'll try to keep it to a positive place, of course, um, in terms of Ahava Israel and love of the Jewish people. So Tana Rabbanan, Vasafta Deganecha, when it says you shall gather your grain, Ma Talmud Lomar. Now we're told, right, that you have to go out and we're told when you, when you gather your grain, when you work the field. So the assumption is we are meant to go out and work. Okay, so the Talmud is asking, on the one hand, we're told to work the land. On the other hand, we're told that the, that the Torah shall not depart from our mouths. We should be learning Torah day and night. Of course, this uh, will um, um, relate to modern day debates. Um, so Rabbi Yishmael gives one perspective this and says, um, these matters are as they are written. You should, on the one hand, you should study Torah, but you also have to work. And so you do the work you have to do. And in your and in the other time, you should study Torah, okay? And so Rabbi Ishmael is saying that this is the modern day B'nai Akiva motto of Torah ve'avodah, okay? We, we learn Torah and we do our work. We need both. That is the ideal. However, we're going to see a second position, which is that of Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, Omer. Efshar adam choresh b'sha'at harisha, v'zoreya b'sha'at zriya, v'kotzer b'sha'at k'tzira. So he says, and of course, in their world, work was agricultural work. When a person is busy with sowing and harvesting and threshing and winnowing and all of these actions which are associated with Hilchot Shabbat, um, what is, um, what's the problem? Torah matahelea, you're so busy working your land. When are you going to learn Torah? Ela bizman shisrael osin ritzono shel makom. He says, 
when Israel does the will of God and keeps the Torah, the work will be done. Somehow it will happen. They won't have to do their share. The work will be done for them. Miraculously, he doesn't, I'm adding that in. Shanamar, ba'amdu zarim, v'ra'u tonche. Ubizman she'en Israel l'sim etanot shel makom, melachtan naset al yedei atman. But when Israel is not doing the will of God, then they're going to have to work hard. And they're going to have to work really hard. Shanamar, v'asaf tadeg anecha. And that's when it is that we work the land. V'lo od, um, and not only will we have to do our own work, but in addition, we're going to be servants to the enemy. Okay, so this he views the fact that you um, now remember this is Rabbi Shimon Ber Yochai who lived in a cave for 13 years um, and learned Torah. Okay, a total ascetic, and so this is a very different perspective from Rabbi Ishmael who is saying we need to work and learn, learn and work, and that is the idea. Um, now, what does the Gemara conclude about this? Amar Abai Harbe Asuk Rabbi Ishmael. Many did like Rabbi Ishmael about Tabi Adam, and it was successful. They were able to work and have food on the table and learn Torah, and they were successful. They were great Torah scholars. Okay, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Velo Al Tabi Adam. But they did like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and just learned Torah and didn't work, and it turned out it didn't work so well for them, says Abaye. So we see that here again, the Talmud is saying, you have two options on the table. You can do what seems, um, you can do your share, okay? Do your work. And then on top of that, you'll have time to learn Torah. And that should be successful and both will be successful. Or you can take the Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai approach and say, I'm going to rely on a miracle. I'm going to just learn Torah and rely on the fact that just as in the famous story of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, God will provide food and drink for me in the middle of a cave and everything will be okay. So maybe for someone as holy as Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, that will be the case. But Abaye says, most people that approach is not going to work for. And so this brings us to this concept of what I'm going to call here, and which is a concept in Hasidic literature called Hishtadlut. We have to make effort. Says Rabbi Yishmael, the world requires some effort from us and then things will go well. And of course, that relates to the story of Israel, right? The story of the Chalotzim, we, the idea that when we put in the effort, things flowed. And we're going to see that this also relates in a moment to the story of Hanukkah. So now, we're going to get back to our question of what do we do with, um, with that Ramah? Remember when we go back to the Shulchan Aruch and the Ramah, where the Shulchan Aruch said that we say al -anisim. And then the Ramah says, if you forget it, then you can say this line about how we can pray. Um, we, can, we can pray for a miracle for ourselves, that God should perform a miracle just like God performed for the Hashmonaim. So the Shulchan Aruch says as follows, we're now quoting another Shulchan Aruch, which codifies in Talacha this concept of what you can pray for and what you can't pray for, what is considered a prayer in vain. The Shulchan Aruch says in source four, I apologize that I jumped around in the sheet, hopefully you were able to follow. So again, if a person prays here, the Shulchan Aruch is recalling the Mishnah we learned in Rehot. If a person goes into a city and hears screaming and crying and calls of, of concern, hopefully that's not happening in my house. Not hopefully, but may it be that that's not happening in my house. Okay, the Shulchan Aruch adds, or a woman is pregnant more than 40 days, where the sex has already become clear and determined. And he says, may it be God's will that my, that my wife has, is pregnant with a male child or a female child. These are two examples as cited in the Mishnah of prayers in vain. We can pray for the future. What can you do for the past? You can be grateful. For the future, you can pray. You can pray for a, a, a female child, a male child, for peace in your home, but we can't pray that that's happening when it might be completely irrelevant and the truth might be something else. We have to make sure that our prayers are not in vain so that 
they have value for what they really truly are. So what do we do with the concept that the Ramah brought up that we can pray for miracles to happen? When are we actually allowed for miracles to happen? So we see here two commentaries on that Ramah that we saw earlier, who said that we can say, Harachaman, if you forgot to say Al-Hanisim in Birkat HaMazon, you can say, may Hashem do miracles for me. Okay, um, which presumably would also um, be in conflict with this concept of not praying a prayer which is in vain. So we have here these seeming conflicts. So the Shari Chuba, who is a commentary on the Ramah, says as follows, and he brings an interesting solution to our problem. Okay, we know from the Talmud, we've seen the Talmud now that says we can't pray for miracles, supernatural miracles to happen to us. We must, we must do things, okay? We must, we shouldn't just pray for miracles. Okay, so he brings back our Rama, our commentary, our, our um, halacha, and says, because it says, may Hashem do miracles for us in the plural, it doesn't say may Hashem do miracles for me. When I'm asking to change the sex of a child, of a fetus, that's personal. When I'm asking some, about something going on in my house, that's personal. But to ask for a miracle, Lashon Rabim, plural, for the entire Jewish community, for the world, very relevant right now, then we can say the Lashon Rabim, may Hashem perform a miracle for us, for all of us. That is permitted according to the Shari Tuba and does not conflict with the early idea that we shouldn't pray for miracles. Okay, um, and he even goes on to say, um, that when, when you say the version, okay, here what's underlined, So here we have another interesting piece, which he adds in. Not only may you pray for a communal miracle rather than a personal miracle, you can also, you have to think about what you're praying for. The Chashmona'im and al we emphasize the military victory. And there, what happened? It wasn't just the Chashmona'im sat back, put their legs up and said, may Hashem bring us a military victory. They did their share. They did their Hishtad Lut, their effort. And for that, that was considered a miracle. And here the Shari Chuv introduces this important concept for us, al derech a miracle by the way of nature, which is not considered a, a prayer in vain, lo hayat filat shav. Ela hayat, aval hayat sarich li zaher melit pavel sheyase lo nes hayot semi derech hateba malam. So according to the Shari Chuv, we have two main points. We can pray for a miracle for communally, for the Jewish people, for the world. Or we can also pray for a miracle if we do our share, if we do our hishtabu, just like the Hashmonim did their share to fight and Hashem took it the rest of the way. Um, Rabbi Akiva Eger uh, adds to this that um, he also comments on the Ramah and says, Hamid palel, ayit palel adam levakesh davar she'inu kefi hateva. Again, we can't ask for something which is against nature, okay? So we can't ask for the sea to be split. We can't ask to walk on water. Lahavdiel, lahavdiel. But, ba'af shahayacholit be'yad akarash baruchu kegon hipila ishto l'shmona chadashim, Again, we can't ask for things which are completely out of our control. Okay, um, uh, and that is his point. Rabbi Akiva Eger is saying, we can pray for something if it can be done physically and as part of the laws of nature. So we are now understanding that there's different kinds of miracles in Jewish thought, one of which is a supernatural miracle, and the other is a miracle which is based on nature and with some of our hishtad lut, our efforts. This idea is expressed beautifully in the Ramban. Um, the Ramban in the book of Breshit, in Parshat Noach, talks about why, this is such a fascinating Ramban and a fascinating question, why did Hashem commands Noah to build the Teba and put all the animals in. Why did he have to do all that stuff? So on the Pasuk in source nine, which says, 
ומכל החי, מכל בשר, שניים, מכל תביא על התיבה, להחיות איתך, זכר נחכבה יהיו. השם was going to perform a miracle in the time of the flood. He was going to save Noah. Given that that was the case, why did Noah have to make so much effort? You can see where I'm going with this. So when Hashem says, um, take each two of each animal into the ark, alive with you, male and female, the Ramban says as follows. Aval hunes, okay? What's the miracle here? If you think about it, there is no way that the ark that Noah built could have possibly held the number of human beings and animals and food and everything else they needed for this. How on earth was that possible? It was a miracle. It was a miracle. Hashem made sure that they were able to fit everything in. Okay, it sounds very similar to Hanukkah, right? Rabim beyad ma'atim. God hechzik mu'at et a year's, a, 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 a full supply of food for all of them in the ark was held. V'im tomar yasen ektana v'yismochel anes hazeh, re'eh Hashem yiparach la'asota g'dola. Okay, so... So maybe you want to say that he should have made it really small, that Noah should have made a mini boat, <laughs> a sailboat, and that it would have really shown Kiddush Hashem, publicized the miracle, Pirsum Hanes. It would have really shown God's hand in the story, especially to a world which was sinning so greatly that Hashem had to destroy it. And yet the Ramban, and the Ramban, we're going to see this is a theme that repeats in the Ramban. For the Ramban, it is important to show that Man, humankind does our part and Hashem then joins in bringing a miracle. So, um, uh, okay, Hashem Yiparach commanded Noach l'asota g'dola k'dei shiru ota b'nei doro. Hashem wanted the people in the generation of the flood to see this ark, to be Right? There was, why did it take so long to get them, to awaken them, to do, to repent? He wanted them talking about it. What's this ark this guy Noah's building? And they'll be worried about the coming flood. Maybe they would come to do tshuva, to do, to do repentance. But why else? says the Ramban, Noach made the teva smaller to minimize the miracle. Ki ken haderech b'chol hanisim b'shabat Torah o b'nevi'im. The Ramban believes strongly that nisim, miracles, come in the Torah and in the prophets, even in the Torah and the prophets, when a person does hishtadlut, does their share. Okay? La'asot ma shebeyad adam la'asot, v'hashar yeh b'yedei shamayim. The people need to do their share, and the rest is in the hands of Hashem, of the heavens. So we see that's very much a strong perspective in the Ramban. We see that this um, occurs again in last week's Parsha, just this past Shabbat's Parsha, in Parsha Ve'ishlach. Ve'ishlach Yaakov melachim lefana ve'leisav. Yaakov sends uh, messengers to Esav, okay? And what does the Ramban say about Parshat Ve'ishlach? This is source 10. Oh, I actually switched source 10 in your source sheet, so please stay with me. Okay, so this parasha is written to show how Hashem saved Yaakov. Now, it's important to point out that this meeting between Yaakov and Esav is taken in the world of biblical interpretation to be the meeting of Yaakov, the Jewish people, and Esav, the Rome, or Edom, Christianity, okay? So it's, it's taken as a sort of um, um, precedent for what's going to happen historically. Just as Hanukkah is about the Jews and the Greeks, um, Judaism and Hellenism coming into conflict, Yaakov and Esav is about Judaism and Christianity and the conflict throughout history. Um, and so here, the Ramban, who of course suffered some of that um, uh, conflict in his own life said, Why does it say Veishlach Malach Veyatilehu Ulalamdenu od Shuhu lo batach betid kato? Yaakov did not rely only on the fact that he had promises from Hashem that he was going to be protected. Veishtadel bahatala bechol yacholato. Yaakov made effort. He did hishtadot. Veyeshba od remez le dorot. This is a message to future generations. Ki kol asher ira la avinu imesa avachiv ya'arelanu. 
everything that happened to Yaakov with his brother Esav will happen to us in Bnei Esav, with the children of Esav. Of course, this is being written in a context where a relationship between Jews and non-Jews is in a very different place than it is today. May it only be good. And so the Ramban sees in this a, um, a guideline, a guidebook for how to, what we have to do in our relationship. And he says, we have to follow Yaakov's way and always be prepared, prepare. Um, we have to follow the way of this tzaddik. Just like Yaakov, says the commentaries, um, prepared himself for meeting Esav, how? With tefillah, with prayer, with gifts for Esav, of appeasement, and with an army, with protection. Okay, so the Ramban is saying, just like Yaakov did not just go and meet Esau without any protection, he made effort. He did his tablut. He tried to do his share by bringing what he had, even though there were fewer men than Esau had, bringing protection, praying, and bringing gifts of appeasement through doing all this effort it meant that then he had done his share. And as the Ramban saw, the rest says, the rest of the help comes min Hashamayim from Hashem. So we see that there are a number of things that emerge from these texts so far. We have the concept of, um, of Nisim being something associated with the biblical world and Hanukkah, um, which is not necessarily something that we are, we have to be careful not to pray for miracles, not to rely on miracles, says several Talmudic texts. And yet we also see that sometimes um, miracles can be delivered, but according to the Ramban, when there is hishtadlut, there is effort made on the part of humankind. I'd like to read with you, we're coming close near the end of our time. We still have another 15 minutes or so. I wanna read with you now this um, work of Hasidut. Um, Hasidut is not my area as my students know, but I came across this and felt that it really touched on some of these issues, which we've seen, which will sort of clarify also where, where this idea or the concept of miracles comes up, how, it, how, it, how to understand miracles in Judaism and also what role prayer has for miracles. So this is a excerpt from the Kedushat Levi, who is a uh, great Hasidic rabbi. Um, and he says as follows, Da, ki hanisim asher asalanu haboe, baruch hu, mitchalkim al shlosha ufanim. Know that there are three kinds of miracles. Okay, until now we heard about two kinds of miracles, ones that are al derecha teva, by way of nature, and ones which are me'al teva, supernatural. He's now going to show us three. Ki hine yesh nisim nistarim, ve yesh nisim niglim, There are hidden miracles, and there are um, miracles which are clear to the eye, right? Kriyat Yamsut, the splitting of the sea, clear to the eye. Hidden miracles all around us. Hanisim hanigalim kemoshen asu lavotenu b'mitraim. Miracles that are clear to the eye are miracles like were done in Egypt, right? Prince of Egypt, um, like the ten plagues, Ukriyat Yamsuf, Shehem Shinui Tviim, that is changing the work of nature. And everyone was able to see the miraculous aspect. But there's also hidden miracles. Now we're getting into Purim, okay? Um, in the time of Mordechai and Esther, so Purim is like, if we have Pesach on the one hand, which is full of miracles that defy nature, and we're gonna see that Hanukkah on the other hand is miracles that are more from the way of nature, Purim is in the middle. Purim's a little different, okay? Um, because we see that it seems quite natural. In the beginning, Hashem gave, uh, made it possible for Haman to rise in power. This isn't something like splitting the sea. Okay, so, so there's a whole storyline in the Megillah which seems to work within, nothing supernatural there. Shemasar Rabim Biyad Matim. And what we say in our prayer, Al Hanisim, that the few won over the, the many, Bitmeim Biyad Torim, and the impure were defeated by the pure. Behina Nes Nistar, that is a hidden miracle. Shehema Baderech Milchama, 
okay? Because that was achieved by way of military victory. Everything was using natural order, okay? Nothing was, was supernatural or relying on a great miracle. Of course, there was a miraculous aspect to the story, but it was hidden, says the Kedushat Levi. Okay. Now, he says, even the hidden miracles have two aspects to them. Okay, so even in Purim, it's hidden, the miracle. Things seem to be running like normal, but we see that Hashem is behind the scenes, um, the whole idea of Esther and Hester Panim, Hashem's hidden face. God is making things to happen for the Ula, for the salvation, but um, in a hidden way, okay? Until he defa defeats the, the planning and, um, and evil planning of Haman, and punished him, okay? Now, this is what I want to get to. He says something really beautiful here. On Hanukkah, the um, humankind did really, were most active, even more than in the Esther story, he's saying. This sounds like a, we're emphasizing the Al Anisim here. We're not even talking about the Pach Shemim, the nest of the, the miracle of the oil. Okay, so the Hashmonaim fought and they won these, these wars. The Asupeula, they made efforts. They stood up for themselves. When we say that Hashem gave over the many in the hands of the few, the great in the hands of the weak, we see that there was a miraculous aspect to this military victory. But it could have been seen otherwise. The people in Chanukah, the Maccabim, the Chashmonaim, did their share, and Yehudit. So we see now that there are three different types of miracles. There's the miracle of the Exodus of Egypt, where natural world is completely defied, okay? Um, there's the... Um, there's the, the miracle of Purim, which is derech um, It's part, part of nature, but it's also hidden. It's not completely clear, okay? And um, Hanukkah, which happened um, by way of the hands of humankind. The katan Purim. Now it's interesting here, he is saying that the more, the more visible the miracle, the higher level it is. Whereas the less visible it is, the more minor the miracle is. The katan Purim, less significant than Purim, is the Nebrot Hanukkah, the candles of Hanukkah. Shahaya nesni star v'gam siyu amitach tonim. So it's interesting in terms of this Hasidic text, it is, it seems that when we have a miracle, which is more hidden, it requires more action on the part of humankind. And I think that this is one perspective. Um, I think that another way, I think that this Kedushat Levi suggests that I think you can also read it as um, this is the message of the Hanukkah holiday. The Hanukkah holiday is the first Hag, which was established in the post-biblical world, by the hands of the rabbis, okay, by the great uh, by the great rabbis, and we see that so much of what this holiday is is about. Um, it's really the Torah Shabbat Peh. It's the oral Torah. It's the um, partnership. It's the it's the fact that the rabbis in the earlier days had the ability to establish such a holiday. And here too, with the miracles, it's based on this idea that humankind had to do their share and that then it would be um, rewarded with Hashem continuing and taking the miracle forward. So this brings us back to our, um, to our topic, which is, can you pray for a miracle? And we see that there is this tension in the Talmud um, about this. There's this big question uh, about, um, about whether you can pray for miracles, what kind of miracles you can pray for. Um, the fact that the Ramah and the Shulchan Aruch brings up this concept that you can, um, that you can uh, pray for miracles to happen to you, 
causes all this discomfort amongst the legal authorities. They start to scramble and say, well, how can that be? We have all these other Talmudic principles that we're not so mechamenes, we're not relying on miracles. We don't want to play that up. Um, miracles are an integral part of our, of our faith, of our ideologies, miracles of the past, believing in them, acknowledging them. But at the same time, we don't encourage relying on miracles on a regular basis. And so, and so this, is, um, this is very much the message of Hanukkah, that Hanukkah, we're finding this tension, which can also be complementing each other, that by taking a miracle, which was perhaps a lesser miracle in that it wasn't clear to everyone that it was a miracle, but yet it allowed, to, it allowed us to highlight the hishtadlut, the efforts, the importance of um, not just relying, but taking action, uh, very much a holiday of action, whether it's the Hashmonaim or Yehudit, or the action of faith in the miracle of the oils. We see that the sources really highlight for us the nature of Hanukkah and the al Hanisim shows us that we can acknowledge, whereas the Talmud really highlights the, the miracle of the Pachshem and the oil and downplays the military, there is something really valuable in seeing the military victory also as part of the miracle, in that it really shows us that um, by doing our share, it is a model for doing our share. We do what we can, and we dive in that Hashem will take us uh, to, through with the rest, not as a tefillat shav of something that already happened, but of something for the future. So with that, I want to wish everyone a Hanukkah Sameach, and it should be a Hanukkah where we all have a Hanukkah of light, of strength, to be able to do our share um, so that we can um, hopefully be rewarded with the miracle of, um, of health and happiness and wishing everyone a Hanukkah Sameach a little bit early and um, looking forward to learning with you more. And if anyone has any questions, I am here. Oh, and I see some chats. <laughs> Somebody asked when al was written. I'll just answer that it appears in we have reference to it in um, Masachet Sokrim, I believe, which is uh, from the Mishnaic Talmudic, actually from the Talmudic period, so pretty early. Um, let's see. Um, feel free to ask. I'm listening. I can multitask, read, and answer at the same time. Yes, yeah, someone asked, can we pray that COVID-19 will disappear as quickly as it appeared? I think definitely we can still pray for the future and certainly we have to do our share. Uh, for sure, for sure. <laughs> Did someone want to ask something? Aaron? Yeah. Can I you asked. repeat, when was al Hanisi written? Okay, I, so I actually, <laughs> probably should have double checked this before I got on, but I'm pretty sure it's mentioned in, there's a work from the Talmudic period called Masechet Sofrim. Um, and there it contains quite a bit of, oh, I did check this. And there it contains some of our um, tefillot. And al is mentioned in there as what we say as part of the candle lighting, I believe. But it is certainly mentioned, it, it is mentioned already in the works of Geonim. The Geonim are the rabbis following the Talmud. So they have the first Sidurim we have are from this period of the Geonim. And so for instance, Sadia Gaon has a, has a Sidur. And if I'm not mistaken, I know that it's in one of the Geonim Sidurim. Um, I just can't remember which one. So that's pretty early. I mean, that's, you know, relatively early for our Tfilot. <laughs> Thanks. My pleasure. Great. Okay, be well everyone. It was really lovely to learn with you and thank you for all these lovely messages and <laughs> hope to see you all next week. Hanukkah Sameach, in two weeks. <laughs> Hanukkah Sameach. Hanukkah Sameach.